Okay, so my name is Billy. I'm a volunteer here at the museum, uh, and today I'm doing a talk on the uh, reconstructing a Jurassic marine ecosystem, which was uh, my master's project. <laughs> so uh, the aim of the uh, project was to determine the structure of a lower Jurassic marine ecosystem and then compare that to modern examples. Uh, and the reason I was doing this was to try and constrain the timing of an event known as the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. Uh, and the hypothesis was that the structure of Jurassic and modern systems would in fact be similar. So what's an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a uh, natural environment, so like a shallow sea, um, and the organisms that live and interact within that environment. Uh, and a good way to analyse ecosystems is to look at food webs. So there's just a um, basic you know, diagram up here of a food web. Um, and you can see that it's split into four levels. So at the bottom, we have the primary producers. So in this example, grass, things that um, photosynthesize and create their own energy from the sun. Uh, then at the second level, we have the primary consumers. So in this case, a rabbit, insect, and a slug. These eat the primary producers. Uh, the next level up, we have the secondary consumers. So these eat the primary consumers. And at the top level, we have the tertiary consumers or apex predators. Uh, and these basically hunt everything else. Um, as an adult, they are not predated by anything. Uh, so obviously, in reality, ecosystems are much more complex than that. But it's just a good diagram to show you the basic structure of a food web. And the ones I'll be showing you later have that same basic structure. So the ecosystem I was looking at was uh, from a deposit called Strawberry Bank. Um, they're from the south coast of the UK near to a town called Ilminster. So this um, like orange band here is where the deposits are found. Um, they are from the lower torsion of the uh, lower Jurassic, so represented by this star here, about uh, 182 to 183.5 million years ago. Um, and this map here on the side is a map of modern day Europe, like, you know, superimposed underneath on top of uh, Europe in the lower Jurassic. So you can see that um, sea levels were much higher then than they are now. Uh, much of the UK is underwater. Um, so a, a lot of the uh, Yorkshire fossils that we have out here as well are from this time when uh, a lot of the UK was underwater. Um, so in uh, Strawberry Bank, we have a variety of different uh, marine animals. We've got ammonites and bivalves um, and a lot of vertebrates as well. Fish, ichthyosaurs, marine crocodiles. Um, and there's also several um, species of terrestrial insects that are found there as well. So this is some examples from Strawberry Bank. Uh, in the top left, you've got the... Um, Stenopterygius, that's an articulated juvenile Stenopterygius. So it's the same genus as the one that's um, at the front of the gallery there, Beastie, the big skull. Um, then we've got a Pachycormus fish. Uh, this is in one of the drawers as well out there. It's kind of laid on its side with one of the fins in 3D. Uh, we've got a, a Pelagosaurus uh, marine crocodile. We've also got one of those outside. Um, and a the forewing of a dragonfly. So the type of preservation that you get at Strawberry Bank is really unlike anywhere else in Europe for the time period it represents. Um, there's soft parts preserved, lots of 3D preserves, um, because they're found in these calcareous nodules. Um, and something cool about Strawberry Bank is that none of the marine reptiles found there are adults. They're all just uh, a mixture of juveniles and infants. Um, and so that could be a feature of preservation bias, but more likely, it seems, um, that Strawberry Bank represents a kind of nursery for marine reptiles. It was very close to shore, indicated by these um, insect fossils that we find, because they weren't living in the sea. Um, so it seems that the water was shallow enough that big ocean predators couldn't get 
that far in. So these young uh, marine reptiles were safe. Um, something else that's worth mentioning about Strawberry Bank is that it was deposited at the same time as this, the Torsion Oceanic Anoxic event. So this was a time when there was uh, a lower amount of oxygen in the water compared to usual. Um, it's been linked to the Karoo Varar Large Igneous Province formation, basically a massive volcano forming uh, on Gondwana. So what is now um, South Africa, uh, Antarctica and Australia. Um, as a side note as well, this camp, uh, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, that's already underway by this point. Um, and that will open up to form the Atlantic. So you've got North America up to the north and Africa down to the south. So um, the Torsion Oceanic Anoxic event produced a, uh, you know, uh, an effect whereby it caused the Plinesbachian Torsion Marine Mass Extinction. So this is not one of the big five mass extinctions, but it's significant enough that uh, it would have impacted you know, the ecosystems of the day. So the far pie chart there is the background diversity before the extinction. The middle one is during the extinction, and the last one is after the extinction. Uh, and sorry, these are um, invertebrate uh, diversity. So before the extinction, it's a little hard to see, but ammonites and belemnites, which can swim, they make up about a quarter of the diversity, whereas afterwards they make up about three quarters of the diversity. And that's because the anoxia was worse in deeper water. So organisms that can swim at the top, oxygen levels were pretty much the same as normal, whereas the ones that were on the sea floor or in it, their diversity reduced by over 50%. So it's just something to keep in mind that this is something that probably affected my results as it was, um, strawberry bank was deposited just after the peak extinction. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. Uh, so throughout time, various events have changed ecosystem structure. Uh, a big one was the end Permian mass extinction, so the most devastating mass extinction in Earth's history. Um, and that, you know, completely disrupted the modern, I'd say the uh, ecosystems of the time. So the marine mass extinction, Mesozoic marine mass extinction, uh, Mesozoic Marine Revolution, sorry, is uh, another one of these events that changed ecosystem structure. And it actually brought about the ecosystem structure that we still have today. Um, so there's a few ways that you can sort of think about what it is. But basically, it was a, an elevation in the sort of arms race um, between predators and prey. Um, whereby predators became more efficient at hunting, prey became more efficient at surviving, and so on. Um, so there's a few ways that you can see this in the fossil record. I've just got some examples here. So on the far chart there, um, it's a bit dark, but the black band at the bottom, that represents stationary suspension feeding epifauna, meaning animals living on the seabed on top of it. Um, and you can see that Throughout time, so this is the Triassic. Throughout the Triassic, they are really falling off in, in diversity. Whereas all these mobile in fauna, meaning animals that can move and live inside the sediment, they are increasing in diversity. Um, and the reason for that is that if you can't move and you're just on the surface of the sea floor, you're easy prey, basically. So animals were becoming more infaunal and uh, more mobile. And we also see in the fossil record an increase in bioturbation in the Mesozoic compared to the Paleozoic, uh, which is reflective of that. Um, so another uh, way that we can see the Mesozoic marine revolution sort of working is in um, repair scars. So this chart here is repair scar frequency on ammonites through uh, much of the Mesozoic. And you can see that repair scars are uh, increasing in frequency through time. So that means that ammonites have been attacked and then surviving. Um, basically, they're not being killed straight away. Uh, and there's also an increase in ornamentation of ammonites. So this is just an example of a horned ammonite. Um, but it can get all like ribbing and all this kind of thing. 
these ornaments increase the difficulty of uh, killing the ammonite. So through time we're seeing more repair scars and more ornamentation on ammonites, which indicates that they're basically becoming harder to kill. Um, so the Mesozoic Marine Revolution was caused by, uh, well, in particular, it was caused by the evolution of these um, new primary producers. So this is a coccolithophore. Um, this is mostly what chalk is made out of. So it's a single-celled organism covered in these sort of calcite uh, plates. Um, and these evolved at the sort of beginning of the Mesozoic, along with other things like uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates. Um, sorry. And that produced two uh, main effects. One is that it stabilized ocean chemistry. So because these things are made of calcite, they're not restricted just to the shallow ocean like uh, corals are. They can float all around. And so when they die and the calcium like sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it creates these massive uh, calcium carbonate reserves down in the deep water. Uh, and they are less susceptible to disruption caused by like volcanic events and things like that. So, so uh, ocean chemistry is now stabilized from sort of uh, like marine acidity and stuff like that. So there's less uh, mass extinctions occurring because of factors like that. Um, but also, it increases the size of primary producers. So before this, primary producers have been even smaller. This thing's only about maybe up to a quarter of a millimetre in size, but it's actually an increase in the uh, size of primary producers. And that means that there's more energy available higher up the trophic levels. So ecosystem, the ecosystem is now more stable and there's more energy available to higher levels, which means that pre predators can become more active and this, then start the Mesozoic marine evolution. Um, and there's kind of two ideas about when the Mesozoic marine revolution started. That's what these are about. Uh, the top one is the Earth during the Lower Jurassic, and the bottom one is during the Lower Cretaceous. Um, and the idea, like in the 70s, when this was kind of developed was that the Mesozoic Marine Revolution started in the Lower Cretaceous as a response to continental breakup, because now there's a lot more shallow sea area compared to in the Jurassic once Pangaea breaks up. Um, and many of the organisms that are, you know, accelerating that prey to prey intensity live in uh, shallow marine environments. But more recently, it's been thought that um, the MMR started in the end of the Triassic as a response to sort of ecosystem recovery from the end Permian mass extinction, that huge mass extinction, the biggest one in Earth's history. Um, so there's these two competing ideas. Did it start in the Lower Cretaceous or did it start in the sort of end of the Triassic? So the reason I was looking at a Lower Jurassic ecosystem was because if uh, that ecosystem structure is similar to the modern, that would suggest that the MMR had already started in the Triassic. So I was part of like a, a bigger research group and we were all looking at different times like throughout the Jurassic to see whether we thought the MMR had started by then or not. All right, so now that I've got all that background out of the way, I know that was a lot. <laughs> um, let's get on to what I actually did for my project. So um, I collected data for Strawberry Bank basically just cataloguing a bunch of different taxa, uh, like different animals that were living there. Um, normally, I would have been going down to the south coast and looking in some museum collections, but I was doing this in the middle of COVID, so it was all virtual, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, so I collected a bunch of different uh, taxa just by looking at you know, scientific papers, things like that, and I characterised four traits. So there's tearing, which is where it lives, basically. Does it live in the sea floor? Does it swim somewhere in between? Um, motility, so how it moves, fast or slow, or whether it can't move at all. Feeding, whether it's a predator or a suspension feeder. Um, and then size. And I'll come back to size later because that's something that changes. Um, I also collected uh, another data set called, like, I called it the Western Europe data set. And that was basically fauna from like a little bit of a wider area than just Strawberry Bank, because um, 
I, you know, Shorebag was just one ecosystem, and I wasn't sure if it would reflect the changes associated with the MMR, especially with the Torsion Oceanic and Oxic event going on at the same time. Um, so there's another data set as well, which includes all the Shorebang data plus other things, just as another point of comparison. So this looks a little confusing, but these are the trait rules. So this is what, um, like the interactions that were allowed to happen within my food webs. Um, so the arrows point from prey to predator or double headed arrows indicate it can occur in either direction. So that, uh, say for tearing, uh, an infaunal organism can uh, interact with infaunal, semi-infaunal and epifaunal organisms. Uh, whereas nectonic organisms can't interact with infaunal organisms. Um, and so on. Uh, the size, so there are three sort of, um, actually, no, I'll say that on the next slide. So the one thing that changes between each of the webs um, is the size rule. So overall, I've got six webs, three for Western Europe and three for Strawberry Bank. Um, and the, I'll just give this as an example. So Caturus, it's a fish uh, from Strawberry Bank, a predatory fish. Its absolute size is 529 millimeters. So that's its at, like maximum adult body size. So one of the webs uses absolute maximum body size. And in that web, um, any organi an organism can interact with any other organism that is, uh, as in like a predator, can consume any other resource that is the same size or smaller than itself. Um, then I've got two that use these categorical size bins, they're called. One with six, so where the size bins are broad, and one with 10, where they're more narrow. Um, and in this scenario, organisms can only act, interact with bins, but with uh, other organisms in their bin or in the one below. So Caturus is in um, size bin four, for categorical six, um, meaning so size bin one is the smallest, size bin six is the biggest. It can uh, interact with prey in size bins four and three. And for the categorical 10 web, it can interact with organisms in size bin seven and six. Um, the reason I did three is because we weren't really sure, like we were kind of trialing this model and we weren't sure which um, size bin like rules would actually reflect reality. I mean, you know, none of them really reflect reality because the biggest uh, organism, or the biggest animal ever, the blue whale, eats krill, you know? So <laughs> it doesn't really work, but we were trying to, you know, figure it out and see what would produce the most realistic structure. Okay, and these are the webs. So there's a bit more going on than in that example I showed you earlier, but um, they are essentially the same. You've got primary producers at the bottom, uh, um, then primary consumers, secondary consumers, and some cases tertiary consumers. Um, so the strawberry bank webs are all at the top, and the Western Europe webs are all at the bottom, and the, um, like the rules become more restrictive size rules become more restrictive as you go from left to right. Uh, so to give an example here, um, like as the uh, size rules become more restrictive, organisms like, are forced to not be able to uh, interact with increasingly more organisms. So this orange dot here at the top for the middle uh, web, that's Temnodontosaurus. Um, so a massive ichthy saw is about 10 meters long. In the absolute web, it can basically interact with um, everything apart from things that are living in the sea floor. Um, in the middle web, it can only interact with 12 taxa, and on the far web, it can only interact with two. So you can see how restrictive it becomes. Um, and that's why you get more of a tiering as you get more restrictive size rules. Uh, it's also worth saying that some nodes so some of these animals disappear from the web as the rules become more restrictive and um, because there was nothing to interact with them. Um, just, you know, a lack of fossil evidence for things of that size that would have been able to predate. Okay, so then I compared these um, webs to modern examples. 
So they're marked as uh, Reef, St. Mark's and St. Martin. Um, these are just uh, like modern ecosystems from islands in the Pacific, uh, just to have the data sets provided. So the four metrics that I focused on were connectance, mean trophic level, total links, and mean links per species. So connectance is the proportion of uh, links that occur out of all the links that like could possibly occur regardless of the trait rules. Um, and that's uh, a measure of ecosystem complexity. So as ecosystems become more complex and as like species diversity increases, that number goes down. Because um, say if you had an ecosystem with five organisms, they're all you know going to really be interacting with each other, or many of the links that could occur will occur. Whereas in the Amazon, where there's thousands of animals, many of those links that could occur will never occur. Um, so so yeah, then you've got mean trophic level. That's an indicator of um, firstly how many trophic levels there are in a web. Um, but and secondly, where the organisms are sort of distributed among those trophic levels. Uh, then you've got total links, so that's just total links. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then mean links per species. So um, yeah, the average number of links that each species has within its web. So so I'll just go through them a little bit. Um, so for the strawberry bank webs they tended to have a higher connectance than um, modern webs uh, and the western europe were actually pretty similar um, but the so sbc10 the strawberry bank web with the really restrictive size rules that was the most similar to modern examples whereas wec10 was the least similar to modern examples so when we were trying to figure out which size rule produces the most modern sort of ecosystem uh, structure? From that, you know, uh, metric alone, we couldn't really tell which one was producing the more um, modern structure. Um, but you would expect connectance to go down, obviously, as the rules become more restrictive. I'm not really sure about why there was a spike at SBC six uh, wow. in connectance. But yeah, we're not really sure what happened there. <laughs> um, okay, so mean trophic level, obviously you would expect that to go up as the size rules become more restrictive because it's artificially producing, well not, it's producing these, you know, forcing these different trophic levels to occur. Um, and in both cases, for Strawberry Bank and for Western Europe, the ones that were most similar to modern values were, um, when there were 10 uh, size bins. Um, but uh, yeah, so and basically, um, trophic level before the marine mass extinct, uh, sorry, MMR, um, was on average lower because um, once these new primary producers came in and sort of pushed more energy into the system, that allowed more organisms to occupy a higher trophic level. So um, it seems that sort of artificially stratifying the web produced a more um, realistic but modern uh, mean trophic level. Uh, for total links, so something to say here is that the Western Bank, um, so uh, Western Europe uh, webs had more organisms like in the webs, in the data set, whereas uh, Strawberry Bank and the modern examples all had actually a pretty similar level. Um, so the total links, the reason that the um, Western Europe webs are so massive on total links is really a function of that, just the fact that there were so many organisms in the data set. Um, but again, total links goes down as the rules become more restrictive. Uh, and then mean links per species um, is a similar pattern. Again, it goes down as the rules become more restrictive because organisms are not allowed to interact with as many. Uh, so the Western Europe webs weren't that similar in the end to the modern examples. Um, I think part of that 
a big part of that was probably just because the data set was so much bigger. Whereas the Strawberry Bank um, data set actually was quite similar to the modern, especially for Strawberry Bank categorical 10, when those size rules were the most restrictive. Um, so that would suggest that having more restrictive size rules actually produced a more modern structure. So, um, so in conclusion to that, I believe that the lower Jurassic ecosystems had a similar structure to the modern based on uh, when you had um, very restrictive size rules. And therefore, the MMR was likely to have started in the Triassic or Jurassic. Obviously, there are a lot of caveats with this. Um, the torsion oceanic anoxic event actually reduced the amount of sort of low trophic organisms in Shelby Bank in the first place. And then the trait rules, um, you know, did not probably adequately reflect the like um, real ecosystem structure, like to the extent that we might have hoped. Um, but saying all that, I still think that uh, given those restrictive size rules, um, Strawberry Bank produced a somewhat modern ecosystem structure. So, um, so yeah, so that's the talk. Uh, has anyone got any questions? <laughs>